You're listening to the Zandbergen Report, where wealth strategies and investment wisdom collide with Bart Zandbergen, your distinguished host and certified financial planner. Welcome to the Zambergen Report. And like we said in our commercial, mm-hmm. we are showcasing wealth strategies and investment wisdom for your essential revolving world. And I am Letitia Burbaum. I'm going to be your guest host today. Thank you, Paul, our engineer here in the studio. I am always impressed at the people you bring in here. But today, never more so, a true Olympian is in our midst. I am so excited. So mm-hmm. I... And... Uh, I always call you Ty. That's just how I know you by. But yes. if if someone were to Google you officially, what would they look up? Taiba Hanif Park. So exciting! And then how would they how would they find you online? Let's spell that so everybody can look that up here. Oh, give, yeah, give us your perfect. give us your name here and spell it out. Uh, Taiba T A Y Y I B like boy A, and Hanif is H A N E E F hyphen park p-a-r-k and you could probably easily find me under usa volleyball team usa website i'm looking at the the wikipedia site right now here (laughs) there you go (laughs) so wonderful so as we've already kind of mentioned a little bit about ty and the amazing things that she has done i wanted us to take a little step back and tell you some things about her um so if you were to look her up, you would find out that she has been to the Olympics not once, not twice, but three times. So we're so proud of you. 2004, she was in Athens. 2008, you were in Beijing. And then 2012, you were in London. Yes. And if I were to say um, you, I would say three things, dedication, sacrifice, and success. And um, today I have the pleasure to have you here in the studio and to share with the audience. And what I hope for everyone to get out of this is um, your dedication to something that you are very focused on and your goal in life um, has created uh, and the sacrifices that you made along the way created this success. And you have now are in that next step in your life and being able to share with other people. And I really want to be able to take a... um, to peel back the layers and kind of say, okay, how does an Olympian, by the way, <laughs> start off and have the dream of being an Olympian? Yes. Um, you know, I wanted to be an Olympian before I even knew what the word meant. Okay. And so um, I grew up here in Laguna Hills, and in 1984, the Los Angeles um, Olympics were here. And they actually showcased some events, I think, um, some the marathon and okay. some, like, bike riding, something like that, a Mission Viejo. Nice. So right down the street, my parents took me to see it, and I had no clue what was going on. But mm-hmm. I just loved the energy of it. I loved that the world was coming together, the excitement, just all of these athletes in one place competing together. And it just it blew me away. It was like this feeling. It was. It was. And, you know, I didn't understand it. And, again, you know, the bald eagle was the mascot then. And I just <laughs> loved this guy. I was like, I want to be a part of this. And so from that day on, it was just... I I want to be an Olympian. You know, yeah. I'm going to find out what it means. And, and how went old back are you? to school. I was five. So at five years old, I was five. You were like, I want to be an Olympian, and this yeah. was a dream. It was. I went back to career day. You know, as far as kindergarten career days go, and they <laughs> ask everybody, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we all usually change our mind. But I raised my hand proudly and said, you know, I want to be an Olympian. Yeah. And I'm sure they kind of laughed at me, but again, I was already tall at that point, so like it kind it makes sense. She's but, a dreamer. <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes. But, you know, from five years old, I've, I've had that dream. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me a little bit along the way. So you're five. You have this dream. What happens next? How do, What's the next step for you in your life? The next step was actually brownies. And so I was in okay. brownies, and brownies had... Um, a little Olympics as well. Okay. So I did Brownie Olympics. What is brownies? I'm sorry. Like Girl Scouts. Okay. Girl Got Scouts. It. So um, we did our little Girl Scout Olympics at Mission Viejo High School, and the local club track team was actually practicing there after us. Okay. And so, um, you know, I think someone approached my parents about joining the team, and so I just started track. And so I actually grew up wanting to be a Olympian for track. Okay. So I did heptathlon and high jump and, and all of that. So I stuck with track 
through all my career. That was your groove. That was my groove. And then I went to elementary school and elementary school at San Joaquin Elementary. We uh-huh. had a school Olympics there as well. I and love so it. I was always chosen like, yeah, you're going to run the relay and you're going to be this best athlete and I want you on my team. And so I did the school Olympics there. And it was just the taste of it ever since, you know, I saw the Olympics, I had Brownie Olympics, there was elementary school Olympics. Yeah. And just as a youth participating in it, it's like, okay, now I really want to do this as an adult and yeah. just continued in club sports to get me there. Oh, that's amazing. So tell me a little bit about um, when it started to become really serious. What are some of the sacrifices when you realize, okay, I have potential. It's it, And now you're going from track to volleyball. And, mm-hmm. and now you know in the back of your mind, like, I really, I feel like volleyball is my passion. How do you get from passion, dedication to being an Olympian? Right. So some of the sacrifices, first off, along the way, you know, <clears throat> Our family trips were <laughs> built around wherever our sporting events were. Your so, meets. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we were going up to Northern California. We would see what was there, and that would be the family vacation. So, yeah. and the, the whole family had to make sacrifices. You know, I didn't get to go to the birthday parties. Yeah. And I didn't do a lot of the high school dances. I think I went to my senior prom, and that was about it. But, mm-hmm. you know, wasn't there for weddings and deaths and all of that kind of stuff. So, those kind of sacrifices along the way. Um, how many hours a day were you practicing if this was Gosh. the kind of sacrifice? You know, when we got to the national team level, we actually do, with my first two coaches, we actually did double days. So we did practice from about 9 to 12, mm-hmm. and then we'd have a break, and then we'd come back maybe 3 to 6 or 2 to 5. Wow. Five days a week. Five days a week. Five days a week. It's a full-time job. Sometimes six days a week. Plus, you still have lifting. So you have lifting three days a week. So it is a full-time job. You know, people wow. think it's a hobby, but, you know, you are <laughs> putting your heart and soul and hours into it, you know? So yeah. it's it requires a whole lot of energy and time that you put into it. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. So um, as far as that goes, talk to me a little bit about how you were selected to be on your first Olympic team and what that process was like? Um, Well, I think it starts beforehand. Okay. Um, So going into college, I was still a little bit new to the volleyball scene compared to some of the other athletes. Okay. Um, But I had a lot of people in my corner who believed in me and I had that big P word, that potential, you know? So um, when I got to college, my college coach immediately started sending me out to the Olympic training center in Colorado Springs where the national team practice. And every summer I would go there and practice with like the A2 team. So not the number one team, but kind of the college national team. Okay. So I would do that and I would start practicing with the actual national team coach and he kind of had his eyes on me so that by the time I graduated, I had evolved to the level where I could kind of step on to the A1 team, the senior national team. So which is really cool. What you're saying is, is you were you were good but in their eyes, you were always constantly having to work really hard yes. to feel like you were going to be able to make that next team. It wasn't Absolutely. just a gift. It's no. something that you really had to work hard for. And I think that's probably surprising because people can't actually see it right now. But I am six seven <laughs> when I stand up. And so people probably assume that I'm just a natural-born athlete and really yeah. good at volleyball. But I was that girl. Again, I was late into volleyball. Age-wise, mm-hmm. finding my balance <laughs> <laughs> and the you know, long limbs and how to just be coordinated. Yeah. And so there were a lot of times where I was actually separated from my team in college and the national team mm-hmm. where I was on a court by myself, yeah. just strictly going over drills with another coach, just catching up to where everybody was. Nice. So, you know, there was a lot of hard work <laughs> that... You know, if you're not playing, a lot of people are like, nah, I don't want to do this sport. You know, I want to see immediate gratification, whatever success off of it. But it yeah. was definitely something that I had to take the time and go back to the basics, go back to the fundamentals in order to see the success. And the success paid off over the years. And the coaches noticed that. It's like the tortoise and the hare. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you worked really hard and stayed focused and you knew what you wanted. You were not going to let anything stop you. I love Absolutely. that. Okay. So now talk to me about the next step of the first Olympics. How did you get selected onto that team? So you were saying that it was, you, you were kind of preparing to get onto that team, but then now you're on. Um, tell me about that process. Getting on the so team. I was um, picked to be on the national team um, probably about 2001, 2002. And it actually started a few tournaments before the Olympics at our world championships. And unfortunately, our starting right side player had an injury and couldn't play. And our coach actually left it up to the team to decide who they wanted 
to start in that position. Wow. And they voted for me. Oh, my god! So gosh. it was, you know, a lot of confidence from the team. You know, yeah. I was still young at that point. I had never started. And so I became a starter at that point and continued to kind of play with the starting team. Um, and so as the year progressed and as we started to get into Olympics, I had stayed in that starting position. And so when it got time for the team to be named, you know, I was named to that team. And all of a sudden it was just like... Game on, you've just, earned your spot. <laughs> yeah, I've earned to... my spot. This is real. Like, it's, yeah. you know, all your dreams have really come true. So it was exciting and scary and nerve-wracking yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. So you were in three different Olympics. Yes. Tell me what each one of them meant for you. Did they Were they different? Or was it all the same? Talk to me a little bit about that. Completely different. Okay. So much different. Uh, 2004, we were actually at war. And so mm-hmm. when we actually took the stand, or when we took the stage, um, a lot of people there were actually booing for us. Oh we couldn't wear USA stuff. You know, usually you would go and proudly support your country and just flaunt your USA stuff. But we couldn't have any logos on. We couldn't wear our USA stuff. We couldn't decorate our rooms in the village. We were just kind of that <laughs> nondiscreet building that was mm. just there. Um, so it was a little bit, we had armored guards You're traveling proud, but you us. can't really be that proud. You, know? you worked so hard to get to yes. the spot. and it was so weird. You know, we we're traveling in like bulletproof vehicles and armored guards in the back. So wow. it was, it wasn't the experience that I thought it would be. <laughs> Clearly. And then we didn't really play well. We were number one at the, at the time in the world and uh, we ended up placing fifth. So it was not a very good experience for me. Okay. And, you know, it was kind of heartbroken. This is my dream and it right. didn't turn out right. to be anything right. that I wanted. All this pressure. Sure. So I kind of retired. I technically retired. And then a friend convinced me to come back. And she said, you know, this is not how it's supposed to be. Let's try this Let's again. Let's take two. So we came back. And again, this time now, we weren't number one. I don't even know if we were ranked. But we weren't picked to be in the medal stand. Okay. And something crazy happened um, the day of our first one. And I don't know if you remember, but there was kind of a terrorist attack mm-hmm. in Beijing. Mm-hmm. And one of the families... Um, the father was killed, he was stabbed, and the mother was injured. Well, that was the parents of one of our teammates. Oh, and wow. And so it was about 2 o'clock before our first match when mm-hmm. we played Japan, and they woke us up from our nap and said, hey, this is what's going on. Um, we need you all to call your parents. Just make sure that let they're all safe. Let them know you're okay. Let them know that we're okay. Check on them to make sure they're okay. Just right. let's all get to a safe space yep. right now. Yep. And, you know, so we did that, and now it's, you know, time to get dressed and get on a bus and go play and kind of forget everything that happened. But it was one of those things that brought us together. Yeah, you were united. You are now playing for something bigger than yourself. You're mm-hmm. playing for that family. You're playing for your country. You're playing to show what Americans are made of. You know, I love it. In the face of true adversity, this is how we step up and we show up for one another. Yep. And so um, in Beijing, with all of that, we ended up coming home with a silver medal, Amazing. So amazing. Incredible, incredible experience in the end, you know, in the aftermath of all of that. And then 2012 was a little bit different. You know, I had started for two Olympics. I was now um, not really a starter. I was. I really had to fight my way to make that team, actually. And uh, now my, you're getting older, right? <laughs> I, I was older. My role was different. It was yeah. more of like a mentor to one of the younger players yeah. and kind of going in knowing that I probably wouldn't play. Okay. Um. But now, again, we're pick number one um, to win a gold medal, and I wanted to be part of that. But now I also have a two-year-old son. Oh, my gosh. So it's different. I now I'm imagine. experiencing this through the eyes of my son, who, mm. again, doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. And it's kind of like reliving my childhood at five years old when right. I didn't understand. But I just knew the excitement that was happening around. And so just seeing it through his eyes again brought that love of the sport, brought the love of Olympics all the way back to me. And it kind of came full circle you can feel that energy. That. You definitely can. You oh definitely my can. Gosh. You know, he's he's screaming in the stands, USA. And <laughs> when people ask him, you know, well, where does your mom work? He's like, my mom works for USA. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, so mm-hmm. great. What an amazing mm-hmm. thing to be proud of. Like, yeah, by the way, my mom's an Olympian and Olympian and she works for the USA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're playing her song right now. Like whatever it come off, like that's her song, not knowing that it's, you know, our actual anthem. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. So what does it look like? What's the next chapter? How does that look like now you've, you've reached your lifelong goal since mm-hmm. you were five and you are faced with the next step in your life. You're like, okay, well maybe you're. After the third one, I'm assuming you you retired again. Yeah, I retired again. <laughs> um, For now, like my second, third time. Yeah. So what does that look like? How do you, um, and we have this, and this could be a pivotal point in your life, but that mm-hmm. dedication 
of something that it's bigger than yourself. You've worked so hard for hours and weeks and sacrifices. What does that look like for you, this next phase in your life? Because you're still young. Now mm-hmm. Now what? What does that look like? How do you define yourself? Yeah. And honestly, it is a process that I'm still trying to define. Mm. And I think a lot of successful athletes and business people probably go through somewhat of a transition. And even military members, you know, something that they've dedicated their lives to for so long. Yeah. When they take that next step into transition into the next life, the next portion of a life, you get kind of lost because you've been, your identity has been tied to yep. your job and who you were. Mm-hmm. And so my identity was partly tied to being an athlete. And I didn't know who I was outside of being an athlete. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it was a process to go through. You know, I'm a mom, but what does that mean? And I'm really a full-time wife. What does that mean? And yeah. what do I want to do with my life? And so, um, you know, there were some periods that it was just kind of sitting in my room, figuring out what, what do I do next? But, um, you know, I had the chance to go back to school. And so I got my MBA in entrepreneurship. And I'd always had this love of designing some clothes and being a tall woman. It's very hard to find stuff that's cute and fits properly. Yeah. And so I started um, some of my master's project on that. And that kind of turned into what I'm doing now. But also in that transition, just finding my love again for my Mm. kids and my family and, you know, being involved in ways that I never could before. Mm -hmm. All the things that I had to sacrifice, I now had the freedom to do. Mm -hmm. And so just really diving into all of those roles. That's amazing. So let's talk about some of those. So mm-hmm. let's talk about first your your business. You know, tell me a little bit about that. Are you? Um, so did you just launch it, or what phase are we in? So in November, it's called seventy nine and Park because I'm six seven, which is seventy nine and seventy nine inches, <laughs> and last name Park. So seventy nine and Park. Um, and I'm starting off with dresses and jumpsuits for tall women. Okay. And so in November of last year, I just kind of did a soft launch. Okay. I have nine items that I have ready to be sold and just kind of started off with a summer dress just to see how it would go. And uh, did pretty well. And, you know, life happens. Some personal stuff happens. And so kind of rolled back for a little while. And now just getting back into it. Um, trying to pick up just providing something for that niche market. You know, there's not a whole lot out there. So being right. someone that can, I understand yeah. the needs, the ones, desires, and you have the a struggles. I, and I have a solution. And yeah. so, you know, trying to find a way that I can really make an impact in the market. So um, provide us your website for your business. And if people want to subscribe or find out more things, what would they? where would they go? Just 79andpark.com. Perfect. And is written out. (laughs) (laughs) Good. No, it's good to know that as well. So that's one piece. Mm -hmm. You, by the way, I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm finding out more and more amazing things that you're (laughs) you're doing now and your your scope is so broad. (laughs) So I know that you're also, and we're going to get to a couple different layers, but you're also a board member. Yes. Tell me a little bit about this board member and what this board is that you're sitting on. So I am on the board of directors for USA Volleyball as the women's national team indoor rep. Um, So a lot of people were pivotal in getting me to where I am. And so it was only natural for me. I felt like I needed to give back. And I didn't know the faces of the people that were on the board when I was an athlete. So I wanted to be someone who could sit on the board and also interact with people so that they felt they had a voice and someone they could connect with and just give back just making sure that they had a positive experience with USA Volleyball. So I I took on that role. I've been sitting in that role for, um, I think, two and a half, three years. And so this will be my last year um, if I don't run for re-election. I haven't decided yet. (laughs) Um, But just, again, just the opportunity to create and grow the game for USA Volleyball is such an important program in my life that I, I feel like it my only duty now is to give back the only way I know how by helping these young athletes. That's amazing. So mm-hmm. you've taken this to the next step and you were telling mm-hmm. me before, this has kind of sparked this um, wave for you to be able to give back. Tell us what mm-hmm. you're doing in your local community now. So now I am gosh, <laughs> um, doing some Laguna Hills volleyball. I am now the varsity head coach and just trying to redesign the whole program. Okay. It's been a program that it's kind of been a lot of athletes 
don't want to go there because it hasn't been successful or um, they kind of pass the time just for being in PE. And what yeah. I would love to do is there are some serious athlete, athletes there, and yeah. I want to give them space that they can grow and go to college. And even if they don't want to go to college and play volleyball, that at least that they can learn how to be better volleyball players and leaders, you know, yeah. strong women, because I think that's what helps what sports helps for women, um, mm-hmm. just becoming stronger mentally, um, physically, emotionally, all of that. So creating a space for these women to flourish there. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So I don't want to run out of time, and I want yes. to be able to make sure I ask you, um, what is your ultimate lesson learned? We ask this to every person that comes into our ultimate show. Ultimate lesson learned. Um, there's no dream that's too big or small. I've been yeah. told no many, many times, and I believed in myself. I believed in my dreams, and so just learning to deal with the sacrifices and being able to walk away with your head held high. So don't yeah. take no as your final answer. If you know that you have more to give, right. just continue to go after all of your dreams with all of your heart and soul. I love oh. that. So in our last things, is there anything that you want to share with the audience or people listening? That you I don't have anything like- verbally, but I brought this. Uh, I know they're kind of streaming right now, so not too many people get a chance to see medals. I don't know if we can see them there. We can zoom in there. I'll let you handle them. Oh, that one goodness. is from they're London. So, they're so heavy. Can I get to at least touch one here? Yeah. Very often. Oh, Absolutely. So this one I is from it. Beijing. So the front of them usually are the same, and then the back, the host country gets to decide what they want to design. Oh, wow. So Beijing, all the medals had jade. So this is a white jade. And then for London, they're known for their subway system. So on the back of it, this kind of describes their subway system. Hold them up to the camera there, so everybody, there you go. And what, uh, um, what did you get these for? What what are they so and what did you get? This them? one is a silver medal from the Beijing Olympics. Wow. Yes. And the one Letitia is holding is the silver medal from the London Olympics. 2012. 2012, yes. So uh, pretty, by the way, and very heavy. Unbelievable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Unbelievable. You think of the you think of the billions of people on the planet and the handful, the literally handful of people that can pull them out of their pocket like you just did. Here. I know. And you would think I had it somewhere so <laughs> safe, but they're really not. They're meant to be I thought touched. you were going to pick out a picture so you just reach in your pocket like, oh, I think I got one of them in here. I know. Yeah. I thought you were going to pull out a photo as well. <laughs> no. The photos don't do justice. I so think you I got the one. Real thing. Maybe yeah. he pulls out the picture that you're like, hey, I met with Oprah. <laughs> yeah, I do have that picture. I should have brought that. Do you keep it under your seat this in your car like when you're going better. to the drive through and say, hey, look at this. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of those things now. I keep it in my back, pack, my backpack sometimes and going through the oh airport. It sets off security every time. And so they're it like, does. is this real? Like they always want to know, is this real? Yeah, like, oops, real. I forgot to take it out of <laughs> yeah. my backpack. Oh, like boy. Said, that one's Talk about real. being casual here. Oh, oh that old thing. Yeah, right. Yes. I yes. love it. <laughs> How fun. Well, thank you so much for being on this show today. Absolutely and I fun. know that our listeners can be able to find you as well. And hopefully that you guys can tweet or um, Instagram or Facebook yes, us. Yes. Somebody had a tweet that they wanted to ask a question. I think it goes to what I was asking you before we went in the air. How You talked about you did this for many years. Mm-hmm. But how long did you have to actually... Give us the routine leading up to the Olympics. How, how many days a week did you practice? How many hours a day for how many years, Can weeks, you say months? Like 16 professional years? Yeah, I think I did about 16 professional years um, throughout my whole career, and that was time overseas. And so, again, you know, we train, usually we come back in May or June for the national team. Yeah. And our season goes all the way to maybe October, November. Yeah. And then from there, we go overseas. And so, again, it's a full time job. We go overseas for another four or five months and play over there. So, Every single day, just about you know six seven hours in the gym plus weights. We it is full time in the hope that you'll get there. In the hope, just a hope. You and never there's no know. guarantee. And there's and by no the way, guarantee. not everyone can say they've been three times. Right, <laughs> right. That, yeah, that's really. But so to put that much time, that that's the takeaway for me in the show. Yeah. We all talk about the things we should do or the things we could do. Olympic athletes like yourself, yeah. you put it all out there on the line. In a hope yes. that maybe you will get to go, much right. less maybe win. I mean, it's just the hope that you'll that you'll get picked to be on the team Definitely. to get there. And one of the things of the Olympics, they say it's not every four years is every day, and it truly yes. is. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and for hold the medals up again. We just right. can, come on. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, where and I'm sorry. Uh, where if they wanted to learn more about the um, somebody else wanted to know about the uh, volleyball. Is is Southern California a big 
I would think it is. Uh, there's a big hotbed for volleyball. It, it, it absolutely is. So usavolleyball.org is where you can find a lot of the up-to-date information about our team, who is currently number one in the world. And um, just Team USA, I think it's .com or .org, will also have just all of Team USA sports that they can find. How many ath- How many uh, sports? I, I know that uh, we've had some people from the Natadors on, the swimming uh, people. Mm-hmm. Um, are there other sports that I, I didn't know Orange County was a big hotbed for? Volleyball. Gymnastics as well. They they practice like in uh, gymnastics. Yeah, swimming, water polo. The yeah, water swimming. polo swimming definitely down here. Other than that, I'm not quite sure. There's tons of athletes here that yeah. go on to Olympic teams though. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So give us how to reach Thank you, you Latisha, again here too. We're always cutting off uh, you and how yes. do, how do people reach oh you if they want to learn more about uh, this show or so what can, you guys do. You guys can go to OC Talk Radio and listen live and they can listen to us there and you would push the button that says Zambergen Report and we are also on iTunes and iHeartRadio. There you go. So I'm going to throw that in iHeart and everybody's on iHeartRadio here today too. So all right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zandbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Catch up on our recent shows by visiting www.bartzandbergen.com. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer on the Zandbergen Report? Email podcast at bartzandbergen.com. Zanbergen Report is a production of OC Talk Radio and is provided for educational purposes only. The content of this program and the views of the guests should not be considered as recommendations by OC Talk Radio or investment advice from the host, Bart Zanbergen, or any other entity attached to this production. Investors should always consult qualified financial, investment, tax, or legal professionals prior to investing.